We're delighted to have with us uh, Michael Albertson from the Teachers College at Columbia University. He's going to talk to us today about student-led assessment in a high school guitar classroom. So let's welcome Michael Albertson. Thank you very much to John and Matt and Elaine for helping uh, get me here. Thank you for all of you being here today. Uh, and lunch is next after me, and I, I heard we're going to have the hot dog diet afterwards. So uh, good luck with the broccoli and ice cream on your flights back. Um, so yeah, so it's going to. <laughs> Just to give you a quick overview of what I'm going to be uh, discussing today is you're all, you're all here today, so I'm somewhat preaching to the choir. But I just wanted to sort of um, uh, go after some of the myths that exist in our field against why not popular music and why we um, are interested in, in teaching popular music in our classrooms. Number two is really the biggest point, which is using popular music to create self-directed learners. Um, I think there's a difference between uh, methods of assessment and what our students can do once they leave us and become you know, lifelong learners. Uh, improvements and extensions on um, things that I've done in my own classroom that I'll share with you. And then, of course, comments and questions at the end. Be very welcome. So I was thinking, planning today's presentation, what are the common arguments against popular music? And they're well documented in, um, you know, in popular media, you know, the bad language, the this, the that. Um, and in the professional literature, you could find this fight going on for a long time. But when I taught for nine years at a high school in Queens, and when I was doing that teaching, I didn't have a lot of time to read the professional journals now that I read as a doctoral student. Um, and so I wanted to think about some of these arguments I heard from people who were in the field every single day, my colleagues, who I thought I might get support from for doing popular music, but actually sometimes had more resistance than I was expecting. So these are some of the things I would hear. And just excuse, we're having a hard time with the display. Classical forms teach specialized musical vocabulary. And the argument there was more than popular music does. That's not as complicated. We could teach about dynamics and tempo and form and all these great lessons we can do. But in reality, as, and this is going to overlap with many other people's presentations today, popular music has their own form, specialized and detailed vocabulary, riffs, um, if you're playing jazz, the edge, all these different things that you have to know to perform in that style. Another argument, classical forms allow for a deeper understanding of written notation. That's great. I got into, if you go to the NAFME site, I'm, uh, there's a lot of people out there who are hating against me because they suggested that guitar shouldn't, all guitar classes shouldn't read traditional notation all the time. And people are like complimenting each other like, way to get him, Evan, and yeah, John, and attacking me, and not at these Evan and John, but <laughs> no, they, I think they're in my corner. I just, they're the names on the tip of my tongue, sorry guys. But, um, you know, people are still, you know, really upset about this notation thing. But as people have also said, popular forms can use traditional and non-traditional notation. And uh, Matt opened with that today. We could teach them, okay, well, this is what Stairway Heaven looks like on the, on the staff. But chord charts, lead sheets, and all of that as well. And of course, popular music is not technically as challenging as traditional forms. And, you know, that argument... I think of a guitar, you know, the guitarist in Metallica, or I think about um, Robert Glasper, who I'll talk about in a second, a really accomplished pianist. And I think we simply know that's not true. So I was thinking, if popular music is so easy, why doesn't everybody do it? Like, why can we all have this formal training for four, six, eight years and can't sit down and play a popular song, maybe? Um, and I thought of this last week. I was in Brooklyn. I saw Robert Glasper and uh, Talib Kweli. Uh, at the band shell. And I wanted to play a clip of Robert Glasper. It's not with Talib Kweli in this case. It's at the Late Show with David Letterman. Um, but I was thinking about how he's such a trained, amazing jazz pianist. He's playing everything at the highest level. And then he brings out a hip-hop artist and can just play this one vamp with his hands the whole time. And I was listening going, with all my training, I have no idea what that vamp is. I'm sure I could analyze it and try to figure it out by ear. But even if I could, I don't know where to place it on the beat and how to interact with the other instruments. So I just wanted to give you an example to hear someone who I think is doing this at the highest level. Look at this, right here, everybody. Our next guest 
an acclaimed uh, jazz band uh, whose uh, new album uh, features collaborations with a number of artists. It's entitled Black Radio. Now, please welcome, with special guests, Lupe Fiasco and Bilal, Robert Glasper Experiment. Everyone. <laughs> I love Dave Brubeck as next as, the, as you know as much as the next person, but I can't imagine like a straight ahead jazzer switching into these styles and out of these styles so fluidly. Um, so I was thinking again. I was coming home. I was driving home from this concert with my wife, and she was like, "That was a great concert." And I'm like, "I have all these great ideas for this presentation now." So I have this hypothesis: If popular forms are less challenging to perform than traditional classical forms, then today's music teachers should be able to operate in a variety of genres with little difficulty. However, that's not the case. It does say that at the bottom somewhere. Next. <coughs> so I was thinking Billie Jean versus Bach, and uh, an experience I had at Teachers College. I was covering a graduate and doctoral course. Uh, Randall Alsop, whose work you may or may not be familiar with, uh, does a lot of work with garage bands, sort of similar to Lucy Green, but certainly different at the same time. Um, and for the first class, when I was covering for him, we were trying to get people who are violinists or French horn players onto guitar and bass and drums. So we said, the first hour, people who play these instruments are gonna, we're gonna break up into rooms and just show you the basics. It's just one chord. We can pretty much get through the verse through. Here's all the different parts. And we get a lot of people who come from conservatory to come get their uh, degree in education at Teachers College. So we have Juilliard graduates and Manhattan School uh, graduates, and they came to us and these people who can play at the highest levels, the most proficiency, probably spent six hours a day in the practice room, after an hour with two fingers on a guitar, had difficulty with bump, 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 bump. And it wasn't just the technical, I've never played guitar. I mean, I could do that in the high school classes I was teaching and have a whole class of 15 year olds doing that in 10 minutes. So it's again, like we were saying with Robert Glasper, it's not just the ability to technically execute it, it's also how does it feel, how does it play, the rhythm was sort of all over the place. And I was thinking about, you know, when, you try, when we try to take uh, traditional techniques and put them into popular music, and I was thinking of Brad Whitford from Aerosmith, I just saw them on Thursday night at Jones Beach, I'm sort of a self-professed nerd. Um, and he had a thing he talks about in an interview about his training at Berkeley and what that did to him as he was already, you know, becoming an, a famous guitarist. I'm not, I don't have a whole lot of stuff going on. I just like to have it. And, uh, and I like to, to be able to turn it on and off when I want it. I recently read somewhere that you are a Berkeley School of Music graduate, is that true? Not a graduate. Not no. a graduate. No, I, I only went for two semesters. Uh -huh. The worst part about it was, uh, you know, they want you to play, you know, you had to know all these scales and stuff, and so it kind of messed up my playing a little bit. So I spent so much time trying to do that, and then I, then I started playing real scaly. I have a tendency to go to do that to this day. Play too scaly? Yeah. And shortly after that um, is when I met these, this, it's interesting this band. Here's someone who's had 40 years of popular music success say that it was the two semesters of training that almost endangered his playing. <laughs> and then someone else who I really love his playing is Captain Kirk Douglas from The Roots, who of course they're the Tonight Show band now. And I found this great video that I'd like to share. Um, and what I want you to do is either 
think about things and keep them in your mind or jot them down. Different themes you hear about uh, his musicality, his process as a musician, and then I want to sort of talk through that to get into this assessment piece for the high school class. There's very little time for practice, um, but I guess, I guess practice comes in the form of playing songs that are, you know, because we play on the Jimmy Fallon show, we're the house band for the Jimmy Fallon show, and um, because a lot of times we have to play with artists that we're not familiar with, sometimes you may have to play in a genre that you're not familiar with. So, so uh, preparing for, for those situations, I think that qualifies as practice. Um, and in the age of YouTube, you know, you, you, a lot of times you'll encounter pieces of music that um, you're curious about and you, get, you can really virtually get online lessons. Just, you know, there's so many people that, that slow down solos so you can learn them. And uh, I've at times gone into work early to, to indulge in that sort of thing. Um, that's that's pretty much and there's that and, and then also you also want to have time to actually do some writing too I try to make time for that um, it's but it's always based around fun and um, but the 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 sitting down and there's the, also the act of just sitting down and playing something that you just have no idea how how to do and I, I heard the uh, the saying that if you're if you're playing if you're practicing and you sound good, then you're not practicing correctly. So um, that type of practicing, I don't do as often as I should, and I need to do more of that, Samantha. So your question is a reminder to me to practice more, so thank you. I, I would say my timing has gotten better. Um, playing with Questlove is, is such a joy for any, no matter what instrument you play, because that's, he's, He's such a metronome, and um, but with feeling, you know. And he, he's he's definitely in the beginning. I've I've gotten a lot more comments about my timing, about how I should watch my timing than I than I do now. It's always good to just as a matter of fact, just at sound check today, our our uh, sound man recorded some of our sound check and played it back afterwards, and I, I was actually surprised at how um, ahead of the beat I was or on top of the beat which and I shouldn't have been so um, there's even though my time has gotten better there's still some times that um, th that I need to sort of watch myself with my timing um, there's also recordings that I've heard of myself playing with the band where my timing was really good and I was like wow that's me you know so um, but in the beginning of my, my timing I was definitely like way ahead of the beat and it was it was talked about and uh, <laughs> that was humbling, and uh, I had to get that uh, together sort of quickly. Um, other, other than that, my playing, I think it's, 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 it's uh, I, think, I think more in terms of, of uh, parts that are being played and, and things that are, try that are more hooky, and just, I try, to, I try to separate myself from what I'm doing and just play like what I would like to hear, try to separate myself from what my hands are doing and just just listen and um, and play what I, I, I would like to hear and not play what my fingers want me to play. So I think I've, I've gotten better in that regard. So what are some of the things you heard in that just short little clip about his process as a musician, as a popular musician? I was trying to get better. Yep. It's nice to hear. <laughs> yeah, how, how it, there's a constant process of self-assessment going on. And, how to, um, and that's where I think sometimes in the classroom, teachers who are a little resistant to popular music can hold that up. Oh, well, it just doesn't teach them to be as reflective of musicians. But I heard many of the same things you would do no matter what genre you perform. Anything else? And, you know, he did the last thing he said, where he said, uh, I wrote it down, separate myself from what I'm doing and just play what I want to hear. I would say that to this day, that's still the most challenging aspect of being a musician, being able to see the whole picture and hear the whole picture 
while perfecting a very specific part of it at the same time. Yeah. And that's, you know, and I think for kids that's exceptionally difficult mm -hmm. to do because it's, it's hard for them to sort of uh, uh, divide it. Uh, they're thinking in that way. I agree. It's very, I mean, it's similar to the Brad Whitford video too. Like my fingers are doing the thing and, uh, you know, I, I been trying to, you know, I, I play jazz for the last 10, 15 years, and it's still, you get people, you hear people say, I just play what's in my head. I'm like, how the heck do you do that? Like, there's a lot of blockage in my head, obviously. I don't, I can't quite get there. Um, and some of these things that you're mentioning were the things I was thinking of, but I heard musical vocabulary. He's talking about being on top of the beat and tempo and all of these things. We're saying the reflective, the personal plan for improvement, self-reflection talking about technique development and how he practices to get better. And also, my favorite part was the learning new styles and repertoire and how he literally every night has to play in a different genre. They may have a different band on. And how do you do that, especially in such a limited time? Um, he also said a three-letter F word at one point. Did anybody catch it? Fun. Fun, yeah. I don't know if you saw my eyes went like this because I forgot that he says that in there. And I'm, I shouldn't be so shocked to hear fun with music. Um, but sometimes those two things are detached too often in our classrooms. Um, and then I also heard the guilt associated with not practicing traditionally. He almost threw that part in there about, that's not the kind of practice I sh not, I'm not doing that, but I really should be. Thanks for the reminder. Sort of like that token gesture of like, I know if I went to a lesson right now, my teacher would tell me to practice more. That's sort of ingrained in us with our traditional backgrounds. So leading into the practical teaching part, why, why I prefaced with all of this is I was wondering, the study and performance of popular genres can facilitate this high level of learning, understanding, and reflection, and these are people that do it for a living, then how can we create similar experiences for our students? So the, the classroom that I was working with, so I'm a third year doctoral student now and I am full time, so I did take a break from teaching, but I spent nine years at a large high school in Queens, New York. We had over 3,000 students in our high school. The majority received free or reduced fee lunch. We had over 100 dialects spoken. I believe we're one of the most linguistically diverse schools. Um, I mean, in, in one classroom, you could have seven or eight different languages spoken. Uh, we were under scrutiny from the New York City administration. We were one of the schools they were trying to shut down and close, and we had to go through all the hearings. And they've, in the last five years, they've had four principals. Uh, the last principal I worked for got arrested across the street for meth for uh, smoking meth. So, you know, that's just to give you sort of the, the chaos that was going on, but how we also found this really good thing in our classroom. In the classes, uh, the classes I was working with to try this new model of um, self-assessment and getting the students to engage in these processes, we heard these musicians engage again. Uh, two guitar classes, about 30 students, mostly beginners, but you always have this, the person that can play the solo for Stairway or whatever. They met daily. Uh, for a year, and it was mostly 11th graders, but we also had 10th and 12th graders mixed in too. So I just, I, I was worried that in the past, my guitar students were doing very well. They were earning high grades, but they weren't maintaining the knowledge they got in October through June. By the end of June, they go, well, you're, you can play this very advanced thing. What about that thing in October? Oh, I forgot that, mister. I haven't played that in years or months, you know. Um, so I was trying to get a way to get them to, this learn, to improve the process of how they're learning and also get a good product at the end. So what I did is in that September of that year, I believe it was 2011, we just spent the first month doing routines um, and I introduced this very, very simply worded assessment rubric, which I'll share with you in a few slides, um, that became the basis of how they would start to evaluate their own playing uh, that met they, they knew how to improve themselves, but also to put it into a tangible way that would also please administrators and the requirements of the new um, evaluation systems around the country. So we, over 10 months, we just did four units, and these units based around the types of chords, because I think as a guitarist, what allows me to play in all these different genres and tunes, and it's basically a knowledge of chords. Once you have that, you can work on your uh, little fills and your strumming style, but giving that can really allow people to play in many different styles. And within each of these four units, we'd have several two to three week mini units that focused on repertoire development. So in bar chords, they would have a list of four songs and they would choose two they would want. So it could be 
Alicia Keys, no one. It could be um, Green Day, When I Come Around. It could be whatever the new song was that month that came out that we were trying to figure out. There were also technical exercises, just building chord knowledge. And then there was a composition um, requirement that came with it as well. So, yeah. Go ahead. Can I do a quick question? Um, did, did the school owns all the guitars? We did. I was, yeah. Did they take them home? or? No, they couldn't take them home. We, we didn't have cases. Uh, when we first started the guitar program, it came out of a thing where uh, the principal had me teaching a band class in a choir room at the same time as another band class. So we didn't have instruments or a room. And I said, well, you know. Uh, so we found these three quarter size guitars in the basement, um, high action, graffiti all over them, missing strings. 50 students at that time, only 25 guitars. So I paired them up in groups of two and just made it work. Luckily, uh, K-Rock Radio from New York was coming in for a business class, saw us and said, well, how many do you need? 50? Sure. OK. Whew. That's very lucky. Yeah. That's very lucky. Um, but the format of the class is what became important. Um, and a lot of things we hear from people, not, not teacher-led, and all these things we've heard in the previous presentations today. Students could work alone with a partner in a group to meet these objectives in all these mini units. I didn't force people. I, myself, hate being forced into groups. Mm -hmm. I do not like being assigned a partner. The worst thing you hear at grad school is, oh, the four of you are going to work on this PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> Basically means I'll be up to four in the morning doing it. Right? No one likes that. It's not, I mean, some people might, if you're not the one doing it up to four in the morning. Not my thing. Um, so they could say, well, today I want to work alone, but when they were working on this one song, they heard two of their friends doing it, and they would shift around the room. So there was no seating chart. They would just move where they needed to. I asked this question. I was thinking about this last night. I was practicing. Does sitting behind my desk make me a bad teacher? For this, they were on their own, and I didn't come to them to see if they needed help. And that sounds semi-irresponsible. But another problem I was seeing is that with all this testing and assessment and evaluation, we're not worrying about developing people as, as people, their social skills. And so many of my students would come up to me in the past and be, Mr., I need, I, I really need the, um, this thing, this help, and couldn't clearly articulate what it was they needed. So I thought, I want to give them the experience of coming up to a teacher and saying, I'm unclear about these chords. Can you help me with this? So I would go around the room, but I also a lot of times try to pull back just to see if we could develop that. And by the end, they would just come up to my desk whenever they needed it, just for a second and go back, and it worked out pretty well. Um, so we self-assessed with the backup guidance of the teacher. So those four assignments I discussed, the repertoire and the chord development and the composition, they would come up whenever they felt ready to perform. And they would sit next to me, and we would have this rubric. I think it's on the next slide. And we would sit together, and they would perform, and we would just talk about it. Well, what, what went well? Well, I got all my chords. What could have been better? I I'm still can't switch between my B minor and my D. OK. So this is the grade we're going to settle on now. If you would like to go back and work on it again, you can come back whenever you want and do it again as many times as you want all the way to June. Um, so that, I think, was the biggest piece. So often we tell people it's about the process. It's about getting better and learning from your mistakes, yet we punish them by their mistakes by giving them a permanent score that they have no chance of improving. So even in June, if there's a very, very simple beginning assignment from October that they didn't do so well in October, maybe a four chord progression, and they come to me in June and can do it perfectly, I'm happy to change that grade for them because it should be a reflection of what you've gained over the year. It's not you need to learn this in two days or else you're going to get this low score that's going to doom you. So here's the rubric. I'm going to try to get in the whole window. And as you're glancing over it, I don't want to say too much, but you see that it's very simple. There's not a lot of academic language. It's fairly consistent in the wording. And the numbers on the side, which you, I mean, you could take them to translate to 180, 60. I didn't put anything else. I don't think it's necessary to rub students' faces in a 1 or a 0. So the benefit of this rubric is this is what I was rolling out in September for them. And I was leading it, but sort of showing them how I was thinking through the process. Because now also, 
a lot of administrators say, well, students can assess their own work and doing things, but you have to show them. They're not just going to come in and be like, I've assessed very high on tempo. You have to, you have to lay it out for them. So it, it's also not so specific that it's flexible, and you see the little star, elements adjusted by importance of unit. So if we were working on a new rhythm in a certain genre, I could make rhythm maybe worth twice as much and weigh it. So it gave me flexibility, but it was a consistent unit of a, um, evaluation that they could use throughout the whole year and were familiar with. So like I just said, I found out that they were and many of you probably experienced this, they were way more critical of themselves than I was. They would go up in the rubric and be like, I messed everything up, I'm terrible, nothing. <laughs> you're like, no, but, <laughs> you're, no, no, but there was, how much was there? So that's part of us teaching them how to evaluate themselves too, is recognizing what went well. Um, the, allow them to get credit for what they can do. If you can play a song and you can play No One by Alicia Keys and you can play E, B, C sharp minor and A, and you can play it with a good sound, and when you play it, you play those four quarter notes like a champ. But when you switch, as we know in guitar, you realize, right? Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. But that to me is a tempo issue. It's not a chord issue. The student knows the chords. But they should be able to, I think, earn credit for what they do well, and it gives them a way uh, that they can see getting better. And I said the rubric was a little flexible, which helped. I think that's there. So when I reflect on this process, now I did this in my ninth year, and then I got accepted into the school, so I left. So I, the one thing I regret is I didn't have more time to revise this and work it out myself. I've shared it with other people um, who've done little bits of it, but I would love to go back and try it again someday. Things that worked with this, when they were assessing themselves instead of me leading the assessments, improved attendance, participation, and academic performance. Um, because if you are a student who's sort of on the verge of dropping out of high school, I mean, we had a graduation rate of barely 60%. So we're dealing with a lot of issues of truancy and non-graduation. Um, but if you see a way that you're allowed to get better, and you, know, you didn't get it this time, but you can get it tomorrow, I think it gave some students some motivation. Cross social boundaries. I believe Jamie in the back has talked about something about this before, about the groupings in the first discussion. This was my favorite part of this experiment that I tried is students who were, I had this one student, straight A student, sweet girl from Pakistan, and she would just come in very soft spoken, and then we'd play <laughs> Black Sabbath, and she'd be like, da, 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 da. but she sat next to a drug dealer. A kid who got arrested right down the hall for dealing. And he, for the first two months, he came to class every day and used the guitar as the pillow. And while I tried to get him encouraged, I also was like, let's see what happens here. And then one day, he sort of woke up, looked over, and was like, can you show me that? And then he started coming in and doing that more and more and more. And by the end of the year, he passed the course. Because, yeah, he had missed two months where he was barely present, uh, physically or mentally. But by the end of the semester, he was like, I'm ready to do it. Can I make up everything I missed in September? Sure, great. Process end product, which I mentioned before, we're improving their learning process, their evaluation self-critique, but they also got better products. Teachers told me, my peers in other departments said, if you give students a chance to improve their grade, no one's gonna do it. They're just gonna be happy just to pass. And I didn't find that to be true of students who traditionally perform high or are struggling. I would say 90 to 95% of them, if they got a grade they were unhappy with, practice and try to do a better job the next time. All students can catch up. If you work in a, a school uh, with an immigrant population, a lot of times students will disappear for two months to go back home to visit family, which is out of our control. Um, but when they come back in a traditional classroom, they're completely lost and it turns into behavior problems and truancy. Again, when you allow them to make up the assignments, there's a way through for them. One-on-one uh, -on -one time, I could float around and I knew where every student was and their ability very intimately. It improved behavior when talking is encouraged. Uh, several of you this morning who have presented have talked about that. If you're in a group and you're saying talking is okay, then when I need you to stop talking for two minutes, you're probably going to be like, okay, let's just listen to him for a second. So anyone coming into our class thought it was chaos, but there was a lot going on. It met the assessment needs of the corporate-driven reform movement. 
my, you know, <laughs> the principal was very happy, um, but maybe for other reasons. <laughs> and uh, students, with ex <laughs> students with exceptionalities, uh, I had a student who had um, a really hard time. His short-term memory wasn't, um, didn't serve him very well, and we would do the chords, and two seconds later, he, like, it was, it was so hard where he put a G down, lift his fingers, not even move his fingers, and put it down, and it would never come back the same way. But in a traditional class where everyone's playing at the same time, okay, everyone, here we go, three, four. He puts his head down. He's lost. He's frustrated. He's upset. But in this context, and in a large group, I would never put tape on his guitar with dots and embarrass him like that in front of the other students. But when they were working in private groups and everything, we had this, and I had tape. We put it in different colors, and he would trace the chords, and he would play. And then I said, well, what if I remove the tape slowly, like one out of the four chords? And then he was just responsible for learning one chord. And by the end, he performed the entire final assignment without any tape from memory. There were issues with tempo and things. But again, that flexible rubric allowed him to achieve success, improve in a class where he might not otherwise. And I translated this model into a jazz band and concert band setting. So with my concert band that year, the students would come in for two weeks and just practice on their own. This is what we're playing. I'll be around to help. Work as you need. So sometimes the saxes would get together. Sometimes someone who could also play another instrument, go over and tutor. The students who finished early would tutor each other. And then we'd come back after two weeks and the music would sound great. So making them responsible for the process instead of me with a baton. Um, things I really needed to improve on. And that's not to say that everything went great and there's not. I think these are really big areas of improvement. My composition creativity element, Peter Webster would be very disappointed. It wasn't um, developed nearly as well as it should have been. I asked students for songs, but I would still like more input from them. And I was still so much responsible for facilitating, even though it seemed like I wasn't, my hands were in everything. And I still want to find ways to pull back, maybe document them with portfolios, as it was a general music class, we didn't have an opportunity um, with the restructuring of the school to do any public performances, which I think would have benefited them. Perfect timing. <laughs> How much direct instruction are you giving? So like, okay, everybody, I'm, you know, here's how you sit, here's how you hold the guitar, look at where my fingers are going, and like, would that be five minutes of the beginning of the <coughs> class? Or? Sure. Um, in September, it was, a lot of class because just holding the guitar, handling them properly, getting a routine, and our, our um, rosters would change every single day. Yeah. So in New York City schools, it's not free, like your roster doesn't get solidified until mid-November. So every day from September 1 to November 15th, your roster changes, you have different students in front of you. But again, when they transitioned in October to working in the small group, someone who came in new, I could just be like, oh, go talk to this person. And within a class, they'd be caught up. Um, direct instruction happened at the beginning of each mini unit. So at the beginning of each two to three weeks, maybe half to three quarters of one class, okay. just to explain, because I provided them the materials, the, the tab, the charts, so they had that. But this is how you make sense of this. Do you have any questions? But then I could always go around if they were still unclear yeah. as we went on. Yeah. If, you, if you don't have an answer, if somebody else has an answer, um, I do something similar with my guitar class, uh, particularly this year. I have a humongous, humongous problem letting them work in their groups. I feel as soon as I turn my back, the first thing that happens is the cell phone comes up. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I, I try to be like, I, I don't want to like deter them from talking and stuff, but it's like they sit there and they'd rather sit on their cell phones than practice. Yeah. What do you do about that? That's one of the most frustrating things, right? The cell phone is. It's been consistently. Our school says they don't allow it, and then you think they that do. they want to sit there and play, but they, not all of them do. Of course not. No, and that's the thing. So I'm not. I and I know you're not saying this about my thing. I'm not claiming that this was. This took care of every issue. There were still those issues. The cell phones. Sometimes I got students to look up things on their cell phones, either videos or whatever. Did the administration agree with that? No, but the door was closed. I mean, and I don't say that you should always go around your administrator's back, but if it's about engaging a student who wouldn't be otherwise engaged, eh. Maybe it was a idea. You know, it was a fine balance of having them put it away and then sometimes just turning a blind eye because some students you confront about it and they shut down for the rest of the year. So I would try to gauge that factor of um, is it worth this fight or not? 
Um, I also, one New Year's, found one of those noise-making devices. So anytime a student took out one of those, I just took it out and went like this until they put it away. You'd be surprised that really worked within a week. No one took their cell phone out because they'd see me reach for the desk. They're like, no, mister, I'll put it away. Not saying that's a great method, but it was something silly that I didn't have to like, you know, raise my voice or send anyone out of the room to the principal's office. Right. With, I, I just find with high school, particularly high school, that is, as soon as you tell them they have the time to do something on their own, that is like yeah. an automatic, oh, check, with, check in with my friends. And sure, I don't know what anybody else does, but I, I've, had, I've had teachers say, oh, just collect their cell phones when they come in. And I don't know if anybody else has any suggestions, but with high school kids, that's the worst for me. It's an iPhone, put the wrong password in, give it back to them. If they don't have a password set, make one. <laughs> I've done it a dozen times this year. It works great, they leave the phones away. Anything else on that or? Yes. How do you think this, this idea will work with a medical student? That's a great question. I was actually thinking about that before coming up here. Um, Elementary school, I don't have enough experience with elementary school to make any judge, um, judgments. I've worked with middle school students. I guess it would depend on your students. I mean, I think it's possible, but I also know some middle schools that are like, you know, people, I know a lot of middle school teachers who quit the first year because the middle school is just nuts, especially down in New York. Um, if it's, if it's going well with other things, I, I could see something like this working. Maybe you reword the rubric, maybe the assignments are a little different, but I think it depends on each class. I had a class of 50 freshmen in bucket drumming my last semester. So you think you get the hang of this kind of thing, and then you get thrown a class like that, and you learn that this might not work for them. So we, we did change it for a little more structure for safety purposes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, legitimately for safety purposes, it was, it was sort of a dangerous class. We, um, we both teach seventh grade general music and we did what was about 10, 10 yeah. weeks maybe of guitar. It, and basically with the same type of outline, and it works yeah, just I think fine. It, I mean, it even works, I don't want to say better because I don't know what you did, but I, I really think middle schoolers, they, you're not going to, they, they, I don't know, at least ours, are, I just cool. feel like our, yeah, they think it's cool. They think cool it's cool and, to play guitar. Yeah, and, and I think they're just or drums. <laughs> typically more engaged when you give them an activity like this. Where they're actually doing, yeah, right. they're definitely doing music and yeah. on their own even more so. And it's one period a day where they don't have an adult talking at right. them. Right. Like what a, what a relief and especially now that like phys ed is, you know, even though it's still required, you know, they're finding ways around that and the arts and everything. I mean, how many of us during it, I know during other presentations I thought of things and opened up my laptop to put in a quick note and people are checking their phones and things like, we can't refrain from it, so why would we expect students to do it like it's not the end of the world I think the hardest thing for them at least I don't know what your general music classes are st structured like but ours we don't have any um, kids that are on ensemble so the, the notion of like practicing to them is like foreign like if I can't do it right away like, oh what the hell I can't do it at all and I'll never be able to do it and that's really hard for them to grasp so and this can take care of that if you can't send the instrument home to practice and people are always like well, we, we work together as a class, the whole class, but when the teacher is lecturing, what do they actually play? Maybe a total seven minutes. Yeah. But they're playing the whole class when they're playing, say, 35 minutes. So it takes care of the issue they don't have enough time to practice because now they're practicing 35 minutes every single day, which is 35 more than before. Um, I teach a similar class in middle school, and one of the thir first things I teach them is a chromatic scale just to get their fingers working and moving. And all of them, well not all of them, most of them the first day are struggle with it. They have a really hard time. And then by the third class they get it. And I can always bring that up when you talk about practicing. And they're saying this song is so hard I can't switch chords. I say, remember when you couldn't do the chromatic scale? Now that's easy. It's the same thing. And two, we give them like, um, we'll give them a sheet of songs and say you choose one of these to be evaluated on. So in that respect, if, if they're having trouble with a certain um, movement, you know, from one chord to the next thing. You pick a song that doesn't have that. Yeah. You know, they have that choice. Can I have a song about the C chord? And they find a song that's easiest for them. <laughs> And you can find, so you can, all this, we, we always lament, oh, I don't have enough time for individual students, but if there's a song that has four quarter notes, again, I'll use Alicia Keys as a thing, to get someone to feel good about it, just change that last one to a half note. Yeah. Bum, 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 bum. And we would come together and play it on the, 
you know, CD player and have everyone play along with it so you could hear what it sounds like. But there are, you can find those ways that when you're talking to 30 or 40 of them at the time, it's just not possible. It is two minutes to 12, so I want to go so we can get to lunch. <laughs> Enjoy the hot dogs and broccoli. Thank you. <laughs>